Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Startup Savant Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan, and this is a show about the stories, challenges, and triumphs of fast-scaling startups and the founders who run them. Our guest on the show today is Rishi Khanna, CEO of StockTwits. Now, this episode is going to be a little different from our normal conversations because Rishi is not the founder of StockTwits. Rishi came on as CEO in 2020, a mere 12 years after the company was founded. And interestingly, StockTwits has not had a founder CEO since 2016. Quick background on StockTwits, they are a social network and community of investors and traders founded in 2008 by Howard Lindzen and Soren Macbeth. As of this recording, their platform has almost 7 million members, that's a lot, and they were the original inventors of the cash tag, which has been copied many times over and is just a pretty cool thing. And I'll let Rishi give us a little bit more detail on stock twits here in a moment. But for the man himself, I said he's not the founder of this company, but that doesn't mean he's not a founder. In fact, he's a two-time founder, and those companies are One Level and Novus. Before we jump in, a quick reminder to subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Just press the big old follow button and you'll be doing your part to help us grow the show. All right, that's enough for me. Let's get this thing started. Rishi, welcome to the show. Super happy to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to join. All right, let's start at the beginning. Can you tell us what is StockTwits? Uh, yeah, so StockTwits, uh, you know, at its core is, uh, you know, one of the largest communities of uh, individual investors and traders uh, across the world, primarily US centric, but um, you know, founded about 14 years ago around the premise of connecting to uh, you know learn from each other, share ideas, and uh, have fun, and hopefully profit in the along the journey. Profit is important. Everybody wants to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so then maybe that's the answer to this question. But uh, but but let me just assume it's not. What is the problem that StockTwits is solving? Well, I mean, I think uh, when you think about investing, uh, it can very much be a, you know, individual kind of single player game, uh, lonely kind of game, or, or you know, maybe you're just happy kind of doing it uh, on your own. But, um, but you know, the markets, and I believe investing in general is an apprenticeship game, and uh, you know, learning happens from others, and the markets are so dynamic. It's not like you know what worked you know, uh, 40 years ago is going to work today or what worked even, you know, two years ago in our current landscape is going to work today. So uh, the opportunity to connect like-minded people um, and find and discover like-minded people, because it may not be your immediate community, it might not be your friends, right? Like you and I could be best friends and have completely different investing styles um, or trading styles. And so, uh, you know, uh, Stockwitz was, you know, one of the first places for the community uh, to to find uh, their tribes, as I like to say, for um, for investing and training. So we're going to get a bunch into community here in a little bit, um, and I'm really excited to do that because it's such a it's such an important thing, and I don't think it's something that we've really talked a ton about on this show. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk about your role as CEO. Um, and as I mentioned in the intro, you're not the founder of this company, and you came on as CEO in 2020. So you've got a little bit of a different, you know, perspective into this company than than a lot of founders do as CEOs of their own companies. So yeah. from that angle of the CEO, what's the difference between the role of a founder CEO versus the role of a non-founder CEO? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, uh, the stage and the circumstances, of course, matter. Um, but I think the biggest foundational difference in having been a founder of my own startups and stuff uh, is, you know, you do have a different level of agency as a founder CEO. Uh, so you you can make decisions, I think, in a different way um, than you can as coming in uh, you know, from the outside. Now, you know, three and a half years in, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable making decisions. But, you know, when I first started, there were certain things where, uh, you know, I didn't feel like I had the agency to necessarily change things or approach things. And I had to make sure I was like learning both from our team, but also from our community being a community website, right? And a social platform. So uh, I think that level of agency and the trust that comes with being a founder, um, you know, has, takes more time. And so you have to earn that and build up to that. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, that would be, I would say as like one of the bigger differences. So then looking at that same kind of that same thought from the other side, from the from the side of the company, what's the yeah. difference for the company when it's run by a non-founder CEO? Well, again, um, 
you know, I think there's phases in it, right? So I think one of the benefits, especially for a company that has been around for a little bit, and it's, you know, not just, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to be a six-month-old company versus being a 12-year-old company, right? Um, I think having that outside lens and coming in with a fresh perspective and fresh uh, lens to the business, you know, the role of the company and the brand in its ecosystem, whatever that might be, um, bringing that uh, to the table, I think is a big uh, benefit to it. And, uh, you know, listen, that can go wrong. I've seen it obviously go wrong with many outside CEOs, but it can go right as well. And and you don't know the answer ahead of time. Um, you know, uh, you know, you only know in hindsight and, and Monday morning quarterbacking is very easy to do. Uh, but, uh, but I think, yeah, bringing the, bringing a fresh perspective and, you know, kind of an outsider's being lens and also coming with experience, uh, brings, I think, uh, much needed refreshing to strategies, to product, to, you know, just how a business operates. Do you ever run into any situations where an investor might say, well, you're not a, you're not the founder of this business. It, or, or I guess maybe they wouldn't necessarily say, well, you're not the founder, therefore you can't do it, but they may have a different opinion on the the investability of the company or the value of the company based on the fact that there is not a founder or a co-founder in that CEO role. Yep. Have you ever run into that? I, I uh, So not with our existing investors. I mean, our investors, you know, uh, terrific. And um, I'm not the first outside CEO for stock with, but, um, you know, a couple of years back, I believe when I was just talking to investors and folks were approaching us to potentially invest and whatnot, um, I do remember speaking with one investor and while they love the profile and the business and whatnot, they're like, the thing is we, you know, generally don't invest in companies that are not founder led or at least have the founders on the exec team. So it doesn't need to be CEO, but you know, um, uh, so I did come into that exact, uh, you know, issue and scenario, um, but it, it's been rare. It's not, um, uh, at least no one else has vocalized it. So I guess is the better way to put it. Like there was that one firm that just, you know, was very upfront about it. And I'm like, okay, great. Totally understand. Well, and it sounds like it was kind of a non-issue because you had lots of other investors who were interested and obviously some that were interested enough to invest anyway. Yeah. So yeah, cool. No need to solve a problem that isn't a real problem. All right, then. Um, so then let's talk about something from the early days of stock twits. Um, there, there's something that I think they did, that the founders did, that I think was really smart. They essentially used the success of Twitter, both in the tech of Twitter and in their user base, to bring people to their own separate platform. And so there's yeah. there's really two things I see going on there. They leveraged another platform to build their base. Yep. They, they took the success of someone else and used it to their advantage. But then the second thing is that they secured that base by creating their own ecosystem and getting users into that ecosystem. And, and obviously, you know, those things, they can both work, but they definitely work better together. Um, you know, yeah. when you when you have a, a, a large base of users and you've got somewhere to put them because there's a lot of danger of staying on someone else's platform. I know, yes. you know, in the in the corners of the internet that I hang out in, everybody talks about, you know, <laughs> Facebook groups is is not the best place to have your your community or and Facebook's going to get picked on twice here, but you know that there was a change several years ago of like businesses on Facebook, they just changed the algorithm to where businesses really weren't getting seen anymore. Yeah. And yeah. so they always talk about, you know, building your own platform or taking people to an email list or something like that. Do I mean, so with those two things being done, I mean, are you, do you look at this kind of the same way that I do, or do you see something different? And with that, is there anything that you would have done differently had you been CEO at the time? Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, having been an early Twitter user, I mean, I was on Twitter, I think back in 07 and I joined stock twits in 2010 as a user. Um, you know, I think this was actually pretty common back then, if you recall, where a lot of uh, platforms and, and apps or websites were jump-started on top of Twitter, on top of Facebook. Um, those were the two primary ones. And um, uh, and that's a great way, especially if you're looking at it, you know, I, I look at those networks as being horizontal networks, right? You're serving everybody in every which way, um, like Reddit does, like a Discord does, like Twitter does, like Facebook does. So they're serving everybody. But, you know, when you're looking to verticalize and find a niche that you want to address and give more tools to, um, starting on top and using that to solve the cold start problem in a network or in a you know user generated content platform uh, is is a 
it is a very uh, smart idea. And, you know, many companies did it successfully back then. Um, but to your exact point, like once you reach a certain scale, you need to have ownership over it, you know, uh, and people are discovering, you know, we actually went through this with Twitter, if you recall, uh, I want to say it was like back in 2010, 11, where they uh, actually had a famous memo written by one of their engineers, uh, uh, essentially, you know, kind of killing their API in a way, uh, where a lot of companies that were built on top of Twitter's API was essentially were shut down. Now, I mean, yeah. you know, hey, 10 years later, we're doing this again uh, at Twitter. Um, and so, yeah, StockTwits was smart at the time to move um, over to, so initially, you know, jump started cold start problem off of, uh, from Twitter, but then, you know, by 2010 moved off onto our own platform. And so today it's all of our own content you know, for the last 10, 12 years. Um, the people still think, you know, I, I do get plenty of questions like, oh, so you guys are on top of Twitter. We're like, nope, it's actually our own. Uh, <laughs> so I think that, you know, that's been a very, a try and true strategy, I think, for that like five, six year period. Um, and then, you know, Facebook came down on it as well, uh, you know, kind of hard. Uh, I, I want to say like maybe 2016, 17, somewhere around there. Um, but, you know, I would not have, uh, uh, I wouldn't have done the name differently. I think that was, you know, a, a tremendous decision because it is really hard to build community. Yeah, it really is. And you mentioned specifically that cold start problem, uh, which, yeah. it, which is something I hope that we can address here in a little bit. But, you know, as we're seeing, th there's, there's, there's a lot of this going on with Reddit right now, um, yep. with the with the change of the API, and and they are seeing the users who are the ones creating the value for the for the product itself, kind of revolt um, yep. at this at this potential change of, of an API, and so it seems like there's there's just a lot of a lot of levers that that can be pulled and a lot of risk in you know seemingly both directions at this point. Yeah, um, you know, once you're at this kind of scale that the Reddits of the world are at, uh, listen, they're not they're not wrong. They have to run a business, and the age of like being able to never be profitable is over. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, and and we touched upon that a little bit ago, but um, I really do think like, and I'm I'm like kind of a more of a value fundamental kind of build a business up from the, you know, kind of unit economics kind of guy, which has not been a you know a thing uh, in the last fifteen years. <laughs> uh, because you have to ask the question like. Hey, okay. When is scale scale that you know you you keep telling us you're going to be profitable at scale? Like, how big did Uber need to be before it could be you know before we could expect profits from it in a real business model from right, it? Right, right. Um, how big does Reddit need to be? Is it not big enough? Like, I think it's pretty darn big. Like, they should be able to be profitable. And so you do have to understand that if you're getting all these services and tools as a user from something. There's got to be something that gives back, um, and you know, maybe they can do it on advertising alone. I, I think that's you know very difficult, um, and I don't and I don't think it's unreasonable. Uh, I think communication uh, and uh, you know maybe the approach of the how it was done could have been a little bit better, but um, you know the general premise of what they're doing is not unreasonable. And uh, you know what, you're welcome to go try to you know start your own startup and uh, build something of value there. So. Yeah. Maybe everyone should. Maybe everyone should go start a startup. Stop listening wow. to this. Go start a startup. But actually, don't stop listening to this. Listen to the whole thing. Yeah. Then go do it. <laughs> there you go. All right. Let's jump in. Let's jump into the, the good stuff. I want to talk about community. I want to talk about network effects. Um, yeah. Now, the word community itself is is really kind of seeing a new life. And I think that I think that this kind of new life may have gotten started around the 2021 time when, you know, NFTs were were yeah. super popular and and you know it, it was what am i getting besides this this pixelated picture of an ape uh well you get to be part of the the community you know um and a lot of these these nft communities really kind of became like country clubs in, in that they you know yeah some of the some of the assets you had to own to be involved with them were like crazy expensive in dollars obviously right yeah. but um so so with the word community obviously is seeing a new life and now there's an older term that i haven't heard as much in the past few years and that term is network effect, um, which is essentially when a product uh, or, or a service, you know, gains more value by the number of users being on it. So like yeah. uh, Facebook, where it's only you and your mom really isn't that valuable. But since everybody's nope. on it, you know, people people like to hang out there. So yeah. with all that being said, how, how do you define community? Um, you know, it is a vast term, but, you know, ultimately it is... You know, there is some like-mindedness or like, um, 
goals, I guess, right, um, that come out of it. But, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you know, humans, we are tribal primates, and we do want to connect. Generally speaking, most humans do want to connect, and they want to connect over the things that are interesting, fun, important to them. Uh, but that's a lot of different things for a lot of different people. So I think, you know, the communities, um, tribes, I, I use the term tribes a lot, right, are, are these, you know, groups of people coming around and gathering around, you know, some shared interest or goal, um, ultimately. And, uh, you know, whether it's kind of the NFT lifestyle community stuff that we saw pop up, uh, um, you know, or uh, professional networks, right? Um, uh, you know, I spent uh, early in my career, I was also at a company called Grissom Liberal Group, which is one of the largest expert network in the world. And so I've been around and in and around networks most of my career. Um, and, uh, and communities, you know, are a foundational part of that. Is there, so we're going to talk about community size here in a second. And, and uh, do you think that there is a, do you think that there is a, a proper number that a, that a community should be before it gains that, that value? Do, and on the other side of that, do you think yep. that there is a, there is a situation where things become too large, um, that things either need to be filtered down or, or focused down, yep. uh, before it starts to lose that value? Great question. I think this goes back to what I was just saying is the important element there to understand is what is the goal of this community? Meaning, hey, if you want to discover all the best food in the world and stuff, right? I, you know, I, I uh, briefly consulted with the friends of the founders of Food52, a big you know, social network essentially for food and recipes. If you want to be able to find the best you know, recipes or fun stuff, you want that community to be as large as possible, right? You want as many people coming in. Um, but if you're looking for a very goal-oriented, let's say, professional network, right? You know, let's say, hey, you wanted to um, really, you know, up your level on uh, on podcast. I mean, you're at the top of the podcasting game, but you know, let's <laughs> say you wanted to level up. So we all, you know, we all uh, could uh, keep leveling up. Um, it's probably more valuable to you to be in a small community of, you know, uh, other, uh, you know, kind of podcasts and whatnot that have similar reach and scale and interests to share ideas. And there, being in a network of 10,000 podcasters is probably not useful to you. Being in a network of 25 high quality ones is much more valuable to you. So I do think, you know, the goal and the, you know, what is the, you know, what is the interest or what is the goal of this um, matters and, and impacts like whether, you know, kind of the impact and size. So, um, you know, if anything, I'd say goal orientation versus interest orientation is probably, you know, somehow correlated to, you know, good size where goal oriented stuff is probably, you know, uh, tends to be better at smaller sizes versus interest oriented stuff tends to be larger sizes. I think that's a, that's a super solid answer. Um, do you think that there's and maybe and maybe you just gave the answer to this question do you think that there's kind of a a formula that could be yep. that could be come up with for you know for companies out there that that run communities whether the community be the business or whether the community just be a part of the business do you think that yep. there's some sort of formula that they can follow to kind of right size their their community for the members yeah so you know i'll um uh, I'm not going to, well, I don't have a, a formula as much as I love algebra and whatnot, but, um, <laughs> Oh, you don't have one of these written down just in your back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can go with like the K coefficient and things like that. Right. But, um, I will say, I think, um, you know, when I talk about a lot of stock twits is liquidity in conversation. So for stock twits specifically at our space, you know, how liquid are the conversations around companies and tickers and stock, right? And uh, and I think, so this goes to that, what is the goal of the community? What is the end? And what does it take to make sure that community feels alive and connected? I think you have to figure out what is the right liquidity level um, for that community. So again, I'll, I'll contrast interests and, you know, like professional goals. So if you're in a, you know, CEO network, um, the level of liquid conversations doesn't have to be every day, right? right? You don't need conversation every two minutes. That's probably really bad for your job as a CEO. Uh, but you want to be able to have uh, availability and presence there. If you, you know, actually I'm part of a CEO network and one of our friends, you know, uh, hit a wall with an investor issue and it was kind of becoming a timely matter, put it in our Slack group and uh, shared it. And there were people there 
uh, ready to kind of respond where he wasn't waiting like seven days for a response, right? And so, um, but versus on stock tweets, hey, like if you have to wait seven days for the next post on something, that's not a particularly interesting platform and community to be a part of, especially when markets move in real time. Right. So I think the the real timeness nature of what the results of the community drive, the liquidity nature, and that's I think how you think about you know, are you at that right number? Does it feel alive for the goals that you need to reach within that community? And that makes sense. I'm part of a couple of different online communities for obviously different different things, yeah. but it seems like what they what they've kind of figured out is that you can have the one large community and then you can gather people together based on yep. commonalities into smaller subgroups, um, which which are much more focused, obviously, on whatever they're based on. Um, yeah. so it seems like there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways to solve this problem. Um, so then let's talk specifically about stock twits. When you came on, there yeah. were about 2 million users somewhere around there, but in yeah. your time at, 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 you know, in this position, that number has gone up to almost 7 million. Um, right. yeah. that's a, it's a pretty big increase. Um, what changes did you make that fueled this growth spurt? Well, uh, two parts to that answer. Um, one is, and I, and I think not enough people will attribute, you know, things to this, but listen, uh, you know, we were fortunate and got lucky with timing with the, the tailwinds of the rise of retail during COVID, right? And the, the only game in town was the markets. And so we benefited tremendously from that. Now you have to put yourself in a position to be able to benefit. So, um, you know, when I joined, I think one of the things I did specifically for Stockwitz is we were working on some other products that weren't necessarily part of the core of Stockwitz. And, you know, uh, just as a result of the times and whatnot, you know, I really took our focus down back to the core and addressing the issues of the community. Uh, and we still, you know, we're always working on improving. We have a lot of, you know, great stuff that we're still working on to improve and make it better and better for the community every day. But we really, you know, essentially took 100% of our attention on improving the experience for the existing community, which then benefits, you know, the rest of, you know, when new members join and new people join, it's an improved experience for them. And at the end of the day, your community is the lifeblood if you are a social platform, right? Uh, go into that you know, Reddit comment and whatnot as well. So we really just focused uh, for those first 12 months when I joined, like between you know, for 2020, we were really, uh, and even Q1 2021, because that was the craziest point in time, right? If you remember Mean Mania. Um, and uh, that's, that's, I think, what it was. We were just focused on making it a little bit better every day for the community, improving things, uh, whether it was little bugs or fixes or just, you know, minor UX changes to make things a little bit simpler, a little bit, you know, more understandable. And uh, focusing on that allowed us to be in the right place at the right time with the, you know, uh, massively increased interest in uh, in retail investing. So I think you kind of you kind of moved directly into my next question, and that was essentially how, how you're creating an environment that activates users so that they stay engaged. And it sounds like what you're saying is just create a user experience that, uh, you know, that is enjoyable, that is simple, that is great. Uh, do you have any other answers to that question? Yeah, I mean, um, those are, of course, you know, things that hopefully every product you want to make enjoyable, you know, whether it's a enterprise B2B software or a uh, consumer. Um, I will say, uh, I, I think we have a lot of work to do on the stock goods front to make it easier and more enjoyable for new users, right? I mean, our existing users, we have users on the platform that have been on for 10 plus years, right? Uh, and, and they understand that, in fact, they're the ones that are going to be the chance if we make a change, right? Like, no user likes change, generally speaking. So, making a change that is for the better bits of the new user actually becomes a bit of a challenge. But I do think, um, you know, that onboarding experience and how do you, you know, what is your North Star in terms of understanding when a user begins to get value out of something, right? Whatever the product may be. So in our case, like, hey, what do we think a user needs to go through to uh, have the chance to recognize the value they can get from being a part of the Stockton's community. And, and, you know, there are different classes of users and different types of users. So, you know, in, in kind of standard old school, like web 2.0, early days, social parlance, uh, you know, it's the one nine ninety model, right? 1% of your users are the creators, 9% are your contributors, uh, and then 90% are just uh, consumers, right? Larkers and stuff. And so 
when you think about those experiences and how do you get to that, you know, time to value, so to say, you got to think about it from, hey, is this user trying to be a creator, right? Or do they want to be somebody that's, you know, out there posting, sharing their ideas? You know, they want, they are going to want one kind of, you know, uh, experience back versus if you're just a pure consumer, you just want to sit there, learn, you're not going to be like, you know, uh, writing posts, replying to people, you just want to take it all in. That's a very different uh, type. And so how you... Uh, you know, understand your users and who you're trying to get on and then how to find time to value for them. And hopefully you understand what value is. And, and that does change over time and at scale and different things. Uh, that I think is a really important part and, you know, something we actually talk about literally, you know, every week now um, because, you know, we're like, okay, hey, once you're at 7 million, how do you get to 70 million? Right? Yeah. Like, what's that next leg? Um, and how do you how do you take that challenge on? And this is a big part of it about understanding Hey, what's that, you know, initial experience like, uh, and going from there. So do you, do you have algorithms in place that kind of identify when a user has maybe moved from one type of user to another, or do you have, uh, more manual systems where like, uh, I think LinkedIn has like creator mode and, uh, and all these other, you know, platforms have where you can turn on and off like creator mode or influencer mode or, or whatever. Do you, do you yeah. have uh certain systems in place that identify that for the user or do you allow the user to identify that for themselves um we know you know again one of the areas that we need to do work on from a product roadmap perspective is we don't have tremendously different experiences for you know what we would call creators today right um and so uh that is one area we talk a lot about and i i've you know i've been in product for 20 plus years um and I am a subscriber to the belief, especially in consumer, but I think this applies to most products um, that, uh, you know, are especially network effect pro uh, products and, and products that, you know, go to scale is you really want to focus on having beginner mode and pro mode. Okay. Everything in the middle, you can kind of let go until you're like Facebook scale, right? And you're optimizing or, or like very large scale where you're now like, you know, optimizing every little piece in between. But in the early days and even, you know, even at our scale right now, like we're big, but we're not like huge by any means, um, is pro mode and beginner mode, right? And these are very different experiences. And so we don't have a very differentiated pro mode. And I think that's something that we, again, talk a bunch about is like, what does that look like? We can identify the pros, right? We have the algorithms and our, you know, like data and tracking, like, hey, who are the creators? Who's the, um, you know, who are the people that would benefit from pro mode or would be interested in that? Um, and, uh, and then, you know, a different experience uh, for the kind of consumer, the beginner consumer. Um, I think the other thing I'll add to that, that has been something I've been thinking about recently. So, you know, there's a lot of much better product people out there in the world than I am, but uh, so if you feel free to yell at me or give me a call, uh, help me out if you disagree with my answer. But um, I think, you know, uh, the rise of mobile, right? Mobile apps um, is really actually for a consumer platform like StockTwix. I actually think like, hey, the mobile apps are generally the uh, kind of the beginner mode or the kind of simple to use mode, mm -hmm. because especially in the world of markets where there's so much data and charts and stuff like that, pro mode is actually much more analogous to kind of desktop mode. Right. Um, and so we have that luxury. I think that applies to a lot of, you know, products where uh, you're creating content or, or you're know, dealing with a lot, you know, vast amounts of content or data in some way. And so that's where I've been thinking a lot more. And you know, I, we were just having this conversation last week with our product team where I was saying, you know, hey, we want to think about pro mode versus, you know, um, versus like kind of, you know, simple mode or, you know, beginner mode. And let's really think about it as, you know, iOS app versus, you know, desktop web. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, for us, that's probably a pretty good barometer that we have, you know, kind of all the data and the instrumentation behind the scenes to, you know, understand users. Um, uh, that, you know, if we kind of go back to basics, I think for us, like that's uh, also another way I look at it. Yeah, you're not going to get an argument for me on that because I and I think just like what you were saying earlier, it comes down to goals. You know, if yeah. I'm if I'm that beginner user, maybe I am the lurker. Maybe I am yeah. the, you know, the person who's just looking to consume um, information or entertainment or whatever from from this platform. And, uh, you know, for that, maybe I'm maybe I'm kicking back in the easy chair and just scrolling on my phone. And that's yeah. the best situation. Um, but actually, based on a conversation I was having, I think yesterday um, there there's this I have no idea what platform it is, but they essentially force everybody into mobile 
And they there are things that you can only do on mobile, even if you are a creator yeah. on that platform. And that feels that just feels like a miss to me because just like what you said, as a creator, when I'm at work, I'm not scrolling on my phone. I don't want to do right. my job on my phone. I'd like, you know, a, a 15 inch screen with a with an actual keyboard as opposed to a, you know, six inch screen in my thumbs. Um, right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think you hit it, you know, nail on the head uh, with that desktop versus mobile situation. Mobile, yeah. Yeah. I, and, uh, you know, I think especially in creator life, and I think it's important. I agree. Like if you, you know, uh, whatever company that is, uh, they should probably think about up in their uh, web kit. <laughs> so then let's uh, let's pivot a little bit from uh, stock twits to another company that you've got some involvement with, and that's Pavilion. Um, and this this company is well, I'll let you explain kind of what Pavilion is. But the but the question that I'm that I would like to ask you after you kind of give a, an overview of what it is, is what is a, a good strategy to build a community from zero as opposed to, you know, coming in and either leveraging from another company like a Twitter, like we said, or, you know, coming into a company that's already got several million active users. Yeah, so um, uh, Pavilion, uh, awesome company founded by a very close friend and former colleague from my GLG days, actually, um, Sam Jacobs, the founder CEO, uh, who's built a great platform. It's, you know, essentially a professional community um, with its real goal of helping individuals um, level up from, you know, in their careers uh, as individuals and not as a part of like, a corporate agenda per se, right? And so how do you uh, build community and give tools to individuals to, you know, uh, succeed in their careers, um, both from a personal like enjoyment factor, as well as like, you know, from all of our standard kind of career metrics of, you know, titles, and you know, the comp and all that fun stuff. Um, you know, the story around behind Pavilion is is a terrific one about like how organically co communities can form and then, you know, you can identify these opportunities. Uh, that really started as uh, a bunch of, you know, Sam getting a bunch of folks together around dinners. Um, and we were all, um, all of us were, you know, founders or running sales operations uh, within our organization. Or, or we were an enterprise like sale kind of company, right? So my last company, I started Novus, enterprise SaaS platform, uh, selling to institutional investors. And so, uh, you know, I, you know, had taken over the sales team um, uh, to, you know, kind of uh, as as one of the many hats I wore uh, during uh, kind of the time there. And we started getting this, you know, together, eight of us or so for dinners and, you know, just kind of sharing everything from, hey, how do we create like sales call plans, right? Commission plans and stuff like that to, hey, how should we think about pricing or how should we think about go-to market? Uh, and organically out of those dinners, if more and more people wanted to be invited and Sam was like, you know, uh, spearheading this and then you know, uh, companies, you know, people that were there as individuals are like, hey, my company would love to sponsor this dinner because, you know, maybe they're a MarTech tool or a sales leader tool or something like that. Um, and from there, like Sam identified, hey, there's really a need that folks had as individuals from a professional development and network perspective. Um, and in this case, he, he was focused around the sales exec is where it started today. It, you know, it is still very much like, you know, some of the top sales leaders in there, but it's also, you know, we have CEOs, we have uh, junior, there's uh, some, uh, a few kind of junior pods and stuff though. The main focus is at the executive level. And so I think, you know, when you find that common goal, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, you found, he found that common goal that we all had of wanting to learn and just be better in our jobs to further our companies and to further you know our individual accomplishments and careers whatever it might be um and okay how do we formalize this like what are the things we need um and you know sam's one of those people that drives a lot of joy around delivering value to individuals and helping others um and for him and his personal journey which he writes a ton about on linkedin and you should go uh read his linkedin post like i mean i think he does a tr tremendous job being transparent Transparent, um, as transparent as you know we can be, kind of on on platforms like that. But um, he derives a lot of joy in delivering value to to us, uh, you know, in the community. Um, and he found that wait, I'm going to be really happy helping people. How do I make this a business? Like, how can I, you know, not have to have a, not a different job and just doing this in the evenings on the side? Um, but you know, very organically, you know, just started with eight people around having dinner and uh, you know, in restaurants in New York City and. Uh, and from there, he's turned it into, you know, I think 10,000 plus uh, subscriber, you know, uh, uh, executive uh, platform. 
that's pretty amazing just to hear just to hear those numbers off of off of what started as you know eight person dinners um now i'm yeah. seeing something kind of kind of interesting here in that that community feels like it started with a group of experts and and it built out into a community that is that is maybe built of experts for other experts and, and there are i'm sure that there are people yeah. you know that are in that community that would not consider themselves to be you know, quote unquote experts. And I'm using that, that term, you know, if you're, yeah. if you're grouping people from expert to non-expert, you know, only the only yeah. a, a and B type of thing. And that actually kind of reminds me a little bit of, um, not that they're similar, but, but it makes me think of uh, masterclass. Like they have yeah. experts, but they're not necessarily building a community per se. They are, they're yeah. taking their expert expertise, their expert knowledge and kind of, uh, sending that in a in a one to many type of yeah. situation, um, as opposed to where this and stock twits are maybe more of like a, a many to many yeah. uh, type of situation. But but let's talk a little bit about um, business models of of maybe these different types because obviously Pavilion yeah. is a successful community. Obviously, stock twits is a successful community, and and in and, and we won't use the word community for masterclass, but. Yeah. It's it's a similar thing in that you know they are they have experts and and non experts. What do you feel like the the business model conception is based on the type of community that you're running? I know that's kind of a sloppily worded question, but maybe you can save me here. Yeah, I think. Um, and you know when you when you ask that, I do think back to our conversation a little bit ago about Reddit, right? And their um, challenge. With their business model, uh, I think you know masterclass and communities like Stocktwits and Pavilion have very different. You know, Masterworks is a distribution, right? Kind of ex distribution of singular expertise. Yeah, they're uh, a little bit of a different thing, right? And um, and so that you can you know monetize via subscriptions, via transactionals, one off uh, things of that nature. Um, I think when you look at communities. The reality is, is um, especially user-generated communities where the content and everything is coming up. Pavilion is going to be a little bit of a hybrid because they do have educational materials and best practices that are put together by experts, like that are part of the community. Right? We help contribute uh, to things. Like when we first started, like one of the main things we we contribute is like. Uh, you know, kind of uh, offer layers, like, hey, somebody's taking a new job to be VP of sales at some company, what should they be looking at in their offer letter? What are the key terms? What are the key elements? You know, these were things that we didn't talk about before, and we all just kind of dealt with it on our own, right? Unless you're in the highest echelons and you're in lawyers and stuff doing your deal. But, you know, for most people, that's not the reality. And so we were there helping each other, like, oh, hey, you need to, you know, make sure you get XYZ kind of severance uh, package if, you know, you don't, you know, let go or whatever, or here's what, you know, equity should be. So um, I think, uh, you know, when you're looking at communities like of where breath matters, you know, models like advertising are externally supported where, you know, revenue comes from sharing things from an engagement perspective. And, and Pavilion had that too in the early days, right? Like those dinners were sponsored and a sponsor, the dinner might cost 5K, but the sponsor pays 15K, right? Sure. So that's the, that's the uh, you know, margin there. Um, but, you know, the other side is if you're delivering enough value there, that subscription model is of real value, right? You want to be a part of something. And the subscription model in this context is not new. It's, uh, you know, it's a country club model. It's a gym membership model. It's, a, you know, uh, whatever it might be, the analogous of people coming together in some connected way and paying for that, you know, service directly is, um, is tried and true. And so um, I think when you, communities can very much benefit from that subscription model. I think the subscription model is works better in niche environments than the generalist environment, though, uh, though you can, you know, uh, still create space even in the larger generalist platforms, I think, for a subscription based model. So what's uh, how, how does Stocktwits monetize? What's the business model there? Um, all of the above. Uh, I'm glad you asked. No. Uh, so, I mean, you know, we look at uh, you know, so today the where Stockwitz is going, right? We have our core business or our core product line, which is our community and our content. Um, so we actually have our newsletters and stuff too that are you know perfectly free. Like we have great daily market wrap up uh, newsletter that comes up seven days a week uh, called the Daily Rip. Million subscribers there, forty percent on the rate, like really awesome uh, content. So that product line uh, is 
generally monetized via media model, meaning advertising, right? And so pretty straightforward, tried and true, right? Um, the other extreme, um, because we're in the markets, we did actually a great uh, trading last year. So we have our own subsidiary that's a broker dealer, and we're launching you know, more and more asset classes that you can trade right on stock grids. And that's a transactional model. But the real thing we're focusing on kind of the second half of the year as well that has become an important uh, cornerstone is launching what I call our tools and data product line. So this is premium data uh, or data that is unique to us, like our sentiment data and trending activity and things that, you know, investors and traders want access to at scale um, that we've traditionally never, you know, had a product for them, giving them access in the way they want, um, as well as, you know, other tools and portfolio tools and alerting systems and, and kind of all, all those things that happen in the world of investing and trading. And the business model that we married to that product line is generally a subscription model. Um, and the beauty of the subscription model is if you can deliver you know, more value than the person, you know, than, than the cost implies, um, you know, you can build a very healthy business that essentially from a business model perspective could theoretically subsume the other two business models. So, hey, if you're a subscriber to our premium, super duper, you know, platinum bundle, uh, well, you know what, you're going to get a completely ad-free experience. Right. So we've subsumed that media business model. And maybe you also get you know, severe discounts or steep discounts on transactional fees and costs and stuff of other asset classes, wherever, you know, there may be uh, fees and costs. Uh, so, um, so for us, you know, I look at it as like, hey, those are our three kind of key product lines, the execution product line, the tools and data, and then our core co community and content. Um, and they actually have three different ideal business models, meaning the best match. You can kind of apply any business model to anything, but what is the right match? What is the best match? You know, it is something that you need to focus on discovery. And so for us, you know, we think and having a diversified revenue kind of strategy, I think, is also important um, going back to over time. How do you focus on, you know, building a profitable, self-sustaining business? Um, you got to really think about that. So you mentioned earlier that, you know, in the days in the days of, of yester, uh, you know, back when money was free and everybody could just build and build and build and never have to worry about, you know, profitability. Um, I, I think that that is obviously it's it's gone um and and now we hear a lot of you know a, found, a lot of founders that are that are building products that don't have a you know a massive uh group of people that are yep. that are already looking for this product um and there's always been the the advice of don't build your product in a vacuum you have to you know you have to have an idea and then you have to get it validated and then you have to build it and then you have to revalidate and and it kind of goes back and forth um but but i think that there's there's a kind of idea of I can build not necessarily a community, but I can kind of tap into a group of people and whether whether it be a community that you have some sort of control over. And, and actually, let's yeah. just let's just stick with that. Let's assume that there is a, a some sort of community that you have control over that at yep. some point in time you can kind of survey them and figure out what it is they need. And then you can build a product or a service that really yeah. serves exactly what they need. But let's then take one step back and talk about that community. What is the the minimum viable value yeah. out of that community that is going to get people to come in and hang out until you're able to you know, build out that product that really serves them? Yeah, the way I think about it, um, so, you know, you, uh, I'm sure you have, as well as uh, your listeners have heard, right? There's the, you know, find a thousand fans, find a hundred fans, right? Um, you know, it's probably some number between a hundred and a thousand. Mm -hmm. But you, gotta, you do have to think about it at milestones because you could find that hundred fans that are willing to pay. Right. right? When I say, like, the fans have to be willing to pay. They got to be able, you've got to be able to say, okay, hey, we built something that you know, we think you guys value because we talked to you and stuff. But now, you know, uh, put your money where your mouth is, right? Um and so you can find those hundred fans that are paying first. That's a great start, right? But I think uh, you know too much of this advice makes it sound like, hey, once you found that, it's over. Like you're off right. to the races, right? And that's not really how like life works and products work and business works. Um, you have to kind of keep understanding. Okay, what are the next milestones? Like that hundred fans is a basic milestone, meaning, okay, there's a shot that more people care about this because you have a hundred people willing to pay for it. Right. But then again, depending on the nature of the product, it, it, you know, the nature of the product could be, hey, you only need five fans, right? If you're writing a super high end investing newsletter, uh, there are newsletters out there that charge $5,000 a year. 
like, listen, you get 10 people, you're making 50 grand a year um, on a newsletter, right? That you probably love writing. Um, that, you know, that's probably a really good start. Then, you know, from that 10, can you get to 20? Can you get to, you know, you get to 50 uh, subscribers all of a sudden? You're at, you know, $250,000 right there in revenue just for writing a new, I mean, for writing a newsletter that delivers that value. Um, we have to think about any milestones and milestones are going to be relative to the nature of the business. But I do think, you know, hey, can we get whatever that right number is to say, can we get enough paying fans mm-hmm. um, to to say, OK, I validated this first milestone. This is enough to make this kind of seem interesting and make sense. What's that next milestone now that I need to you know, kind of prove whether it's with the same value being delivered? It's more of a go to market issue or, hey, now I have to deliver a little bit more value. Uh, you know, if, if you guys were like the cross the chasm, right? Like, you know, how do you get over that chasm? Mm-hmm. And I think you have to you know, go through those milestones and steps to identify what, what are the right numbers there? What are the right, you know, what is the right um, you know, fan base you need, you know, depending on the product? Sure. Yeah. And that and that reference um, is I think it's called 1000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. It was a it was a, an That's essay right, yeah. that he wrote umpteen years ago at this point. Yeah. You know, there, there's so many more community questions that, that I could ask. I mean, I think we could probably go for two or three more hours, but unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> we don't have we don't have two or three more hours. So we're going to have to move um, into into a new into a new topic. But fortunately, this is my favorite question that I get to ask every episode. What is okay. your number one piece of advice for early stage entrepreneurs? Oh, number one, I might cheat and like make it a two parter. Um, I think, uh, again, going back to what I was saying about myself being, um, you know, kind of a little bit old school, um, I will say if you're going to be a founder, right, if you're going to build a real business, like if you want to build a business, um, you've got to stay close to your numbers. You've got to know your numbers. There's too many founders that I've come across that, you know, They've raised money because raising money was easy and they weren't paying attention to the numbers. They weren't understanding because, hey, they're a product guy, they're an engineer, uh, whatever it might be. Know your numbers. Like, don't let that, it doesn't mean you have to be the accountant or the bookkeeper, right? But you got to pay attention every day, every, you know, week, every month, stay on top of that. Um, and then, you know, the world generally isn't a home run world, meaning, uh, you know, the mantra I used at Stockwitz, especially when I first came on and, you know, we were like, how do we improve the community and make sure like we're doing the right things um, is small wins equal big things, right? This is a, this is like compounding interest and whatnot. So um, focus on, you know, getting small wins, small wins every day uh, or every week, uh, you know, whether, whatever it is, whether it's the product, whether it's in the team, um, whatever it might be, uh, focus on how, how can you break things down into small wins that'll get you to your bigger picture, your bigger goal, whatever that might be. Um, and I think, you know, you do those two things, doesn't guarantee success, but at least like, yeah, you know, I think uh, those are two like really just, uh, you know, important foundational things, I think, just for running a business and having a shot to succeed. All right. Excellent advice. Thank you very much for that. What is next for Stocktwits? What are we going to see here in the next, uh, the next couple of months? Um, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of exciting stuff coming out in the next couple months. Um, you know, on one hand in that execution business line, we are going to be launching, uh, you know, some new, uh, asset classes to trade. So we're going to be, you know, uh, sharing that kind of in the coming weeks. Uh, but, uh, you know, options trading and some other asset classes that we're looking at to bring onto the platform. So giving easier and like, you know, hopefully like simple access uh, to, to that side of the world. But the community and social side, like really leaning into uh, community and we're focused on how to, you know, the world of investing, the data is the data. Like we don't get to make that up, right? I don't get to make up the stock price of Microsoft as much as I would like to. <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, I think how we supercharge that and how we allow the community to enhance the value we deliver. We're working on a lot of features there um, and to make it you know, kind of easier to access to that uh, question we were talking about earlier. How do we make it more accessible and um, uh, enjoyable for that you know, newer user or the simpler user, but deliver tremendous value to the entire community and especially then the pros as well. All right, Rishi, this has been a ton of fun. One last question, where can people connect with you online and how can our listeners support StockTwits? Yeah, um, you can connect with me on StockTwits. I'm R. Connor uh, on StockTwits, uh, uh, Twitter as well, and then, uh, you know, LinkedIn too. But uh, yeah, I mean, publicly, you find me on uh, StockTwits and, uh, and Twitter. Go find them on StockTwits. We're going to put the links to everything else here in the show notes at startupsavant.com slash podcast. 
Rishi, this has been, again, just so much fun. I, I, I could talk, I could talk community with you all day long. Um, and so to, yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say, Hey, say, say, say more, give us the last words. What do you want to tell us? Um, you know, find your tribe, uh, enjoy, like, you know, don't make, uh, things don't need to be uh, so stressful online. Right. I mean, uh, find your tribe, uh, you know, uh, enjoy it. And, uh, for all the founders out there, listen, it's not easy. Um, find your tribe for that too. Found, being a founder, being a CEO is a lonely job, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, Let's stick to the community theme here and find find people that you know you can talk to about the challenges that we have. If you're a founder CEO, like hey, feel free to like I said, reach out to me as well. Um, and uh, you know, well, let's keep building. Thanks, Rishi. Thanks, Ethan. All right, that's gonna be it for this week's episode of the Startup Savant Podcast. Thanks for watching. Hey, did Rishi say something today that's got you fired up? Let us know what it was and let us know what you're gonna do about it in the comments below. Two quick things before you jump off. First, have you checked out StartupSavant.com? They've got guides, tools, reviews, and all sorts of other great stuff for founders or really anybody who wants to go deeper into the startup world. Again, that's StartupSavant.com. Check it out. Number two is to share this show. If you're enjoying these founders, look directly below this video and press that share button. Your best friend is bored to tears right now, and you can come to their rescue by sharing this video with them. We'll be back next Wednesday morning with another great founder and more awesome stories. And until then, go and build something beautiful. The Startup Savant Podcast is produced by Truick.